We are pleased to introduce our next keynote speaker, James H. Fries Jr., whose career has covered the global financial services industry. In June 2020, he joined Wirecard in a newly created management board role responsible for integrity, legal and compliance. Within his first day, he exposed internal fraud, was promoted to CEO and then initiated a global restructuring. He is of the opinion that a sustainable business strategy must include values and a commitment to ethics and compliance as part of its focus on serving its customers. A compliance officer can be most effective only when deeply knowledgeable of the business and part of that strategy discussion to show relevance to the executive leadership and supervisors. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and participate in this conference. As we've heard already this morning, a lot there's a lot of consensus with many of the speakers, um, and it's something to be expected. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask this first question to get uh, a little idea of who our participants are and particularly who has joined us as we come back from the uh, lunchtime break to get an idea. And we see overwhelmingly that uh, compliance officers are the best represented. And it's partly for that reason why I wish to turn a little bit the focus here, dip, having had different roles in my career as a chief compliance officer for global organization, as well as having served as CEO in two different organizations, to talk about the different perspectives and to try to give advice as to how you can be most effective in that role uh, as a compliance officer, because partly you need to define that role and you have an opportunity to define that role. A lot of times the CEO will come in and they'll say goodwill that I want to empower you. You have the ability to call me anytime you need, but you need to know when to that phone. You need to know when and how to deliver the messages. Um, the CEO is a lot of other things going on and you want to be part of that role in creating the good business model. Part of the reason that I think we have this challenge is even knowing what compliance is. The, the very word itself, I'm an American and a lawyer by training, its origin is back in the 1930s, so uh, close to a century ago with the capital markets and securities law regulation. The way we talk about it today, including as it's not really translated into other languages, such as German, where there's really no appropriate word other than uh, compliance, is something that causes uh, a lot of questions. And it's part of the reason why I asked for this second question uh, as to how often the compliance team members are engaging with the senior most business leadership, because that really is one of the best ways to reflect how management views compliance and how important your input is to them. The results are, are still coming in but the numbers look like they're holding uh, fairly steady that a um, little less than a third, maybe 30% of the compliance officers here represented, again, the largest part of the conference participants um, are, are only, sorry, um, in about 30% of the time have uh, uh, an isolated dialogue with their management as opposed to what really is more of our goal grouping, those that have a more regular aspect of discussion. But also really discussion is a key word in that regard. So let me come back to why I think that's important and how I think that this uh, goes to the aspect again of defining the role of compliance. Building upon what we heard already from some of the earlier speakers. Klaus Mosmeyer, who's a good friend, I knew him when he was at Siemens and as he started to work at Novartis and talking about even that transition at another 
conference where we spoke together last year, he, he said very clearly that following the rules is not enough. Um, Professor Stringer similarly said that he didn't think that more regulation, more rules was the answer in terms of better compliance. I take a little bit of a different uh, task on that comment, from Professor, Professor Stringer, and that's really in the aspect of more prescriptive regulation, um, stifling entrepreneurial progress. That's an aspect that leads us into falling into what's measurable, what's known, and the aspect of tell me what I cannot do. What you want to be doing with your management team is telling them the ways to achieve their goals in the best way possible, the best way possible being something that they should feel comfortable about ethically and under principles, something that should be welcomed by their team, the, the staff, something that won't be called into question by their counterparts. And again, that's a themes that I'll come back to again uh, and again. The third question that we've tossed up here for, again, the compliance uh, team members is how many of you have experience in the business area and what you now support in compliance? I think, frankly, this is a great result because we see about half and half uh, of the persons, again, holding fairly steady, having experience in the business, because that's one of my introductory comments that you cannot be relevant to your management, uh, especially the CEO and the board members, if you don't understand uh, your business lines. My hiring philosophy was always quite simple, and that is bring me the best people who know the business, and I can teach them what to do in terms of compliance and what we need to move forward to set up an organization. So what does it mean in setting up an organization? Well, so much of it starts with the governance framework and the structural component. Don't ever forget in your role as um, compliance officers and, and make sure the CEO and the management hears this from you, that they shouldn't just ask you this question again about how often do you report. Tell me when there's a problem or keep, watch my back. Um, and I hope to not hear from you unless there is a problem. That's the worst possible relationship and the worst possible culture, even if they're goodwilled. The management needs to know that they're the ones that own the compliance. They have ultimate responsibility and it's something they cannot delegate. What essentially the CEO has done is you have been hired by the CEO, just as in other areas of the organization, as an executive to help them achieve the best compliance outcome. And we haven't talked too much today about the reporting lines of defense, but the first line of defense in compliance uh, will always remain the, the business. So what you're actually helping the business focus on is risk mitigation not just not doing what's not allowed, right? That's the prescriptive aspect. It should be a prerequisite of your program to not violate the laws or violate the rules. And where we're going into, where we're active in regulated businesses, such as my background in financial service this sector, as Klaus Mosmeyer was saying, and pharmaceuticals, healthcare business, very highly regulated. So a lot of time has to be spent on prescriptive rules. Other aspects that apply globally, such as anti-bribery and corruption, there shouldn't be a need to discuss them in these day and age. Setting up the framework and holding people accountable, making sure they know what needs to be done. But so much more about the broader aspect of compliance, again, have to be put in the terminology that the CEO will be looking for, what will make sense to them. The CEO will be looking at their products and services, how they continue to be innovation, looking forward. Um, but you want to make sure that the CEO understands that how the customers increasingly view us and how some of our own team members, our own staff views us, as uh, some former uh, speakers uh, alluded to, especially in the millennial age, has a lot to do with this value system. And increasingly, the focus on third-party 
due diligence. It's not just a question of our due diligence on our counterparts in the chain. It's a question of their due diligence on us. It's their expectations to want to be our suppliers, our counterparts, our customers. And the broadest aspect where I think the most fundamental changes are coming from and uh, of the greatest importance to the CEO is has been alluded to a number of times, this investor perspective, the ESG movement, the environmental, the social, the, the governance that ultimately guide the, the cost of capital. I'm, I'm one who throughout my career and increasingly and um, probably looking forward is focused on this governance aspect because that's the aspect that is least tangible, least understood to people. You can talk to anyone on the street and they'll understand the notion of uh, environmental values and, and protection, uh, regardless of the views of them. They'll understand the aspect of social, that we want to know that we have diversity and inclusive in environments and not um, violation of human rights in the uh, chain of suppliers that we have. But the governance, that's a little bit harder. It's something that is less tangential and frankly, the hardest because there is no one size fits all. It has to be risk-based and set up for what makes sense for your business. And that's what it comes back to. I think uh, Kim Bike did one of the best jobs in setting the tone. He viewed compliance as good for business in terms of the products or services. But again, what does that mean as a practical matter? It could mean product compliance, that is the reliability of the goods you sell. Does it break down? That's one of the aspects in the, the diesel gate scandal that came up. It could mean reliability in, in IT and services sector, such as um, what is the recovery time or the 99.99% availability of some of your services. But that's an aspect of knowing what is the business focused on and what are the risks. It's very different set of risks if you're in the wholesale environment versus the retail, if you are in the highly regulated businesses, as I mentioned before, or just setting up in general for your corporation, or for me, um, someone who's focused his career in an international and cross-border environment becomes even more clear that the notion of we'll just try to follow the rules is something that's destined for failure, because as soon as you cross the borders, the rules might not exist. They might not be clear. They might be conflicting with one another across the, the jurisdictions. And that's something that I enjoy because that's where you need to come back to aspects of ethics. Where do we want to be? Not just where must we not be, right? Again, just not avoid what's uh, prohibited specifically, because frankly, there's not a lot um, in that realm. It's more where we want to be, and that's where the, the principles-based aspects is so important. And I can tell you my experience in, in Germany the last uh, seven years um, shows that not unique to, to Germany, but a, a society and a culture um, that is focused on following the rules has a more difficult time in dealing with principles-based or ethics-driven areas. So to combat that aspect or, or try to overcome that, and also in a cross-border environment with different rules, you have to be more aligned with the notion not of trying to have the answer right away um, as to this situation, here's a black line, we can't cross it. There's some areas uh, where that exists, but again, that's not most of what should be spending your time. Um, it's an aspect of can we ask the right question? Can we engage with the business in that dialogue? And how can we engage early enough? You don't want to be called in and be the person who says no, um, right, as something's uh, rolled out or when you heard about it too late. You want to be that partner to help them define the way to achieve their goals in a way that you tell them mitigates the, the risk of noncompliance. And a big part of do doing that as a practical matter is having systematic and structured processes. That starts, of course, with your compliance strategy. And the compliance strategy, it can tell you the best thing that, that you can do also to protect yourself is just make sure it's aligned with the business strategy. Make the business leaders 
define for you and confirm that this is the strategy in which you're aligning your compliance strategy. That's so important because you have to prioritize and you also have to deprioritize. And part of that engagement, especially with the CEO or the board that is looking at costs, is looking at conflicting aspects, is looking at ultimately what risks they will accept. Part of your risk assessment is should not be to say there's no risks here. If we train everybody, we don't have a problem. It should be to show the management how much effort needs to be put in to achieve what you think is a procedure reasonably designed to leave the risks that can be accepted. Leave the risks. I can tell you this as a former regulator, I used to say to banks, the only way that you can remove the compliance risk from the banks is to shut them down, to do no business whatsoever. Same true if you make loans, there's some of them that are going to, to go bad and you don't know what is the one that's, that's going to be. You don't know when you're launching a new product if it's going to be a success, but you reasonably would not have launched it if you had not done the steps to be ready for it. That's a type of business discussion, and that's the dialogue that your CEO and your board members want to hear from you. You can always ask for more resources. You can always ask for better IT systems. And frankly, they should be pressing you to say it's not just about more bodies. It is about using data. It is about learning from what we've done before. It is about coming back with dashboards and KPIs for those things which are measurable. Don't forget, everything is not measurable. We can have proxies for it. We can use behavioral science as part of that. But ultimately, what you need to be as a trusted partner is to come back, again, someone that's trusted as knowing the business and be able to make a decision when you're dealing with something unprecedented or unexpected. Experience certain helps, certainly helps. But frankly, you don't want to have experience with just a parade of problems. Otherwise, you haven't done something to mitigate the risks of them occurring again in the future. Um, let me also make a, a comment in, in this context with respect to whistleblowers, which we've heard of Friday morning, and you'll hear more about uh, this afternoon. The culture of the organization should be to allow people to speak up and challenge. It's not easy. And frankly, you need to know when to speak up, um, not speak out of turn and on what basis you're, you're going to challenge. But generally, that should be valued in an organization, certainly an agile organization, certainly an inclusive organization, one that benefits from the diversity of views. But we know that's not always the case. And for some individuals, they don't feel comfortable with that, or frankly, they've been turned down. And that's why the whistleblower aspect is so important to open additional channels, in particular, in some cases, anonymous uh, channels, um, and to remove the fear of retribution. But I can only emphasize, as important that is, and people look to the extended guidance and expectations for the whistleblowers, don't think that that is your opposite channel, that you're using that to shut down, frankly, the more important one of that active engagement among people. And finally, one of the best aspects of the whistleblower um, notion, the, the red flag of an individual raising something, is the courage to say no and to walk away. That the biggest single thing that you can do as a compliance officer, um, and again, it's the nuclear bomb or the, the end of the card to say that, no, that goes beyond my principles, um, I'll resign and I will walk away rather than be part of that organization. Just take a break. I think we may have a couple questions here. James H. Fries, Jr., thank you so much for joining us here at the European Compliance and Ethics Conference. It's great to have your insights. One of the first questions I have for you is, as you made the switch recently at Wirecard, what do you think is the main mindset switch from Chief Compliance Officer to CEO, just perhaps as a, as a practical example of, of what that means? I, I think that's an important aspect because, again, it gets to the the thesis of looking at it from different sides of the coin or across the, the table, the, 
the biggest aspect of a CEO is that they need to be decisive, uh, building on the past, but always looking at ahead, uh, embracing changes, the disruption, the, the competition. So they are used to making decisions in the absence of full information and anticipating. It's one of the aspects that some compliance officers, in particular those coming from a, a lawyer and audit uh, background, may have trouble with because they're trying to gather as much information as possible, which is entirely appropriate in their role, but they need to come together and come with a, a recommendation, a view. Even if as part of the governance, the decision has to be left with others based on all uh, possible inputs, not just the, the compliance. But I think this aspect of being uh, decisive and the decision-making and the willingness to accept risk is a big aspect of the difference. Okay, thank you, James. Um, before you moved to Wirecard, you were actually managing director and chief compliance officer, group AML officer for the Deutsche Börse Group for six years. What attracted you to the role at Wirecard? Well, I guess as uh, most people said as a reaction is that I'm not one to shy from challenges. Uh, that's certainly the, the case. Uh, I like building things. Um, and frankly, big opportunities often come in times of disruption and uh, crisis. But uh, for me, there were a couple aspects that were particularly uh, appealing. One, just as at the Deutsche Börse group, and it's not necessarily the case of all organizations with compliance, the regulatory aspects were a key part of the strategic growth. So for Wirecard, it was moving from a tech firm into the increasingly regulated sector, getting additional licenses, and I was joining it as part of the business leadership, not in a compliance role, overseeing compliance as well, but uh, to take on these licenses and build the regulated business. The second aspect is I was supposed to oversee these efforts across all the control systems to create a structure. Um, and there it was fairly plausible to me that uh, like many fintechs that had grown uh, very quickly, uh, that it needed to hire a professional management team. And I was part of that management team to come in um, and integrate the global organization. I must say in, in that regard uh, that um, for all the, the proper uh, references to Wirecard throughout this conference, it shouldn't be overlooked that there was a lot of good business and a lot of good people, uh, both locally in some terms of the technology solutions and some of the acquisitions that had been made globally of pre-existing businesses that weren't even fully integrated, and that's part of which uh, has been sold off businesses that I knew about, uh, such as that in the US that I'd previously been a regulator of, or those in Singapore that I would see as I traveled there uh, regularly, that um, it was so prevalent in all of the local payments or even the airlines in which I flew, in which most of the pay line payments were made uh, through uh, Wirecard. Um, so it seemed like a, a good fit that uh, an expert in the payment systems uh, business, emerging technologies, global, um, and actually for me personally, a platform in which I would promote uh, more good governance practices. James, we know that you're not at liberty to comment in detail uh, about what happened at Wirecard because of ongoing legal proceedings. Nevertheless, would you like to comment on lessons learned as we heard from Dan McCrum just before the lunch break? Uh, sure. Um, and uh, again, please excuse me if I can't go into uh, a lot of uh, details in that regard. But I guess building upon what I thought I was going into versus what I had found that um, there was an organization which a, a small portion, um, including an, unfortunately in leadership positions, had uh, misused uh, the organization for self-enrichment. Um, one thing Dan McCrum uh, alluded to was uh, quite obvious uh, to me when that they were missing some of these most basic structured processes um, and steps that one would expect from an organization of their size and, and certainly of uh, an listed organization with such a prominent position in the 
capital markets. Um, they were working towards integration of some of the acquisitions, not as far as I would have thought. But um, I guess the another aspect that quickly struck me and was also visible from the outside is that many of the persons, uh, both the most senior management as well as those in control positions, had essentially grown up within the company, been there for quite a long time, which has a good aspects. But the reason where that is uh, bad is that they were not aware that things are done differently elsewhere. So meaning that it was very easy to come in with a fresh perspective to be able to say, I can't believe we're not doing this or other organizations do not function this way. And that is an aspect of a lessons learned. You want an aspect of both continuity and change. And that's true in a business strategy team, but it's also true in your compliance team. Someone came to me and they said, I've been 25 years in a compliance area if they could not tell me that they don't recognize compliance today versus when they started, then they would not be in a good role despite having a CV of a lot of aspects there. The other aspects I'll just say is that, um, as we've heard and is very clear in the press, uh, that there were failure of external parties, um, certainly those with otherwise uh, renowned names, but that's not limited to others. Uh, the aspects of external advisors, the law firms, the consulting firms that, frankly, I fired within the, the first days of joining there. Uh, I expected more from these parties because if I could walk in and see things within a few hours, they should have seen these aspects. And it comes back to what I said before of a whistleblower. You can be a whistleblower as an external party and advisor to you. you can withdraw from an engagement. You don't have to just say, well, as long as I'm being paid, I can continue the, the business and just close my eyes. Um, that frankly was one of the things that I said in my first uh, town hall to the, the staff. Um, I already was convinced that there were only a relatively small portion of the individuals that were directly involved in what was uh, apparently illegal activity, quite apparently. Um, but there are others that probably closed their eyes or didn't speak up uh, long enough. And some of them that did have that conversation with me and said, well, I raised an issue or I raised a concern. I said, but did you resign? Did you step back? Did you say, I'm going to disassociate myself from that activity? That's something that anyone can do. The whistleblower, the internal person, the compliance officer, but also these external parties. And that would have been a massive tip off red flag that was not there. Um, we also saw in terms of, of a lot of little issues, this would not necessarily be so apparent from the outside that um, people had not been removed or held accountable. Frankly, that's one of the biggest reasons why rules are important. Because if we don't hold rules, then it's hard to say you broke a rule. For that, we can't keep you here. I think we have time for one more question from the audience, which is, um, how do you uh, influence a speak-up culture in an organization? I think you have to uh, leave room for people to speak. A lot of it is done from close interaction. Uh, I can tell you as a CEO, I would read comments that that came to me and reply to people so that I they knew that they were read as fast as I possibly could even if it was just to, to say thanks to have to walk the halls uh, when you can physically to chat with people as much as you can to invite them even if it's a virtual lunch get in touch with people so that they know that you're there listening James H. Fries Jr., thank you so much for joining us here today at the ECEC. All the best for your next future role. 